2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. The first uh, item is for the committee to decide whether to take consideration of its Stage 1 report on the Harbour Scotland Bill and its report on freight transport in Scotland in private at a future meeting. Is the committee agreed? The committee is agreed. The second item is to hear evidence on the draft Enhanced Enforcement Areas Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015 from Margaret Burgess, Minister for Housing and Welfare, Linda Leslie, Housing Strategy Team Leader, and Jacqueline Pantone, Principal Legal Officer at the Scottish Government. Uh, this instrument is laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions may come into force. Following this evidence session, the Committee will be invited to consider a motion to approve the instrument under the next agenda item. Can I begin by welcoming our witnesses this morning, and can I invite the Minister to make an opening statement? Thank you, Convener. And I welcome the opportunity to give evidence on the Draft Enhanced Enforcement Area Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015. Drew Smith brought forward an amendment at Stage 3 of the Housing Bill introducing the provisions on enhanced enforcement areas and requiring draft regulations to be laid by 1 April 2015. He made it clear in his supporting remarks that the power to designate enhanced enforcement areas would only be used in exceptional circumstances and on that basis I was happy to support Mr Smith's amendment to the Bill. These regulations, if passed, will enable local authorities to apply for new discretionary powers to assist them in tackling acute problems in a geographical area. In order to make an application, the local authority must consider that the area has an over-provision or concentration of private rented sector accommodation, which is characterised as having a poor environmental standard and by overcrowding and where there is a prevalence of antisocial behaviour. I was clear throughout Parliament's scrutiny of the Housing Bill that I want to raise standards across the private rented sector, and that's why the 2014 Housing Act includes a number of new measures, measures which were supported by this committee and by Parliament, introducing regulation of letting agents, enabling disputes in the private rented sector to be transferred to the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland, giving local authorities discretionary powers to report breaches of the repairing standard to the private rented housing panel, along with the power to enter a house to establish if there is a breach, and duties on landlords to provide carbon monoxide detectors and to carry out electric electrical safety checks every five years. I also want to see local authorities making effective use of their statutory powers for landlord registration, and work is underway to revise the landlord, landlord registration guidance to support them to do that. We published our consultation on, inf on the policy approach to the enhanced enforcement area regulations in autumn last year, following discussions with individual local authorities and with COSLA. 33 responses were received, and these included responses from 13 individual local authorities, the Scottish Association of Landlords, Shelter Scotland, and a number of registered tenant organisation networks all who were broadly supportive of the approach we're taking. Enhanced enforcement area designations is intended to be used only to tackle the most difficult and extreme circumstances where a local authority has not been able to improve conditions in an area by using its existing powers. That's why when applying for designation of an area, the draft regulations require a local authority to set out its wider strategy for improving standards in the private rented sector. I want to ensure that we take a proportionate approach to this process, so the draft regulations give local authorities the flexibility to bring forward the most relevant evidence of the three criteria specified in the Act to support an application. Local authorities have a wide range of existing powers to tackle poor standards in the private rented sector, and when an area has been designated as an EEA, the local authority would then have a number of new discretionary powers that it can use in that area. These would give a local authority a new set of tools to tackle an exceptional set of circumstances. These powers would enable local authorities to require a landlord who is applying for registration or who is renewing their registration to provide an enhanced criminal record certificate to evidence that they are fit and proper person, 
require landlords to produce the documents specified in the regulations for inspection by local authority officers to evidence that they are complying with their related duties and responsibilities as a landlord, authorise a person to enter the house or building to ensure that the accommodation is safe, well managed and of good quality. As set out in the Act, the regulations also set out the purposes for which local authorities can use these powers. They are to enable local, the local authority to exercise its functions under landlord registration legislation, ensure the safety and upkeep of the house, ensure that information is available to tenants and enable the local authority to decide whether the house and the building it is in are safe, well managed and good quality. Convener, in drafting these regulations, the Scottish Government has tried to give local authorities additional powers to respond flexibly and proportionately to exceptional circumstances, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, can I now invite members of the committee to ask any questions they may have to the Minister? Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Minister, uh, I have criticised some of your previous uh, regulation of private landlords on the grounds that, quite often, uh, the nature of the regulation was such that the good landlords will engage and the bad landlords will not. So, as a result, we simply regulate the good landlords and not the bad ones. This uh, piece of uh, regulation, however, uh, seems to go that step further to allow local authorities to take action against the bad landlords. Is this the step in the right direction that it appears to be? Well, I, I very much uh, hope it is the step in the right direction. It is about a landlord identifying um, where, even within their existing powers of regulation, there, some landlords are just not um, playing ball. Basically, and it's about when there's an area and it's impacting in a whole area and a whole community where a local authority has been given these discretionary powers to take action and bring that area uh, up to standard and take action and the landlords are not uh, following the rules. Is there any danger that we may fall into the same trap that we have previously, that when the regulation is put into practice, it simply puts further pressure on the, the good landlords and fails to... Uh, pursue the bad ones. I, I don't see that with this specific piece of legislation. This is very targeted and it's where a local authority and a communi ha community has identified a problem. It is in exceptional circumstances and it will only be and only affect bad landlords. And the, the Landlords Association and the Good Landlord organisations are very supportive of our action here. Yeah. I, I, I believe that the, we, we may be uh, achieving that with this instrument, so I'm um, supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I very much support the thrust of this uh, um, instrument and, and what, what it's seeking to do, but I've often been aware in the past that local authorities use their existing powers of enforcement, sometimes in disproportionate ways. And in questioning them to try and discover if there's some rhyme or reason to it, um, it's been suggested to me by council officers that often they're reluctant to, for instance, uh, uh, use their powers for uh, serving, serving repairs notices because the recourse is for the council themselves to undertake repairs and then attempt to recover the cost of this. And that often it's because... Um, they feel that their chances of recovering these costs are pretty slender, uh, that they don't use the powers. Would this instrument be subject to that concern, especially given that some private sector land uh, lords are actually companies that are sometimes resident out with Scotland and indeed out with the UK? I don't see that these are uh, powers that are additional powers and discretionary powers and it's for a local authority to determine if they feel using these powers would improve a very difficult situation in their area. Uh, we don't envisage this is, these are powers that are going to be used uh, throughout every local authority area in Scotland. It is only where a local authority themselves say there is a problem here. We want to tackle this as part of our overall strategy in improving an area and improving a, a, a problem within the private landlord's sector in that area, the private rented sector, and it's in those circumstances that a local authority would gather the evidence uh, and bring to the, the, the ministers to determine that 
specific area as an enhanced enforcement area where they can take advanced enhanced action. So they themselves would be applying to take that action. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the Minister? Minister, you've said that obviously these are additional powers and discretionary powers, so it's likely that they would only be used in very exceptional circumstances and there would only be a, a limited number uh, of local authorities uh, who would seek to invoke uh, the regulations. But is, is there anything you can say in terms of how the government will um, re keep this matter under review to see what the impact of the regulations has been in practice? I think all uh, legislation we would keep under review. It is a discretionary power for local authorities to use. It's an additional tool in the toolbox for local authorities. As I've said, I don't expect it to be used that often. There are some areas, I think we're already working, am I right in saying, in Glasgow, in an area of Glasgow with the City Council, who are looking, if these regulations are improved, to look at um, having an advanced and enhanced enforcement area as part of their overall strategy of improving a part of Glasgow. So that in itself will give us um, an indication of how the regulations are working. We'll certainly be looking at that. Um, and obviously the, the committee will be kept informed of, of what's happening and the committee can always review it as well. Thank you for that. Um, the, there are no further questions. The third agenda item this morning is the formal consideration of motion S4M13157, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft Enhanced Enforcement Areas Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015. Can I invite the Minister to speak to and move motion S4M13157? OK, I, I move the motion. Thank you, Minister. And can I invite comments and questions from members? There are no further comments and questions. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M13157, in the name of Margaret Burgess, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes, agreed. The committee is agreed. That concludes the consideration of this affirmative instrument. We will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament. Can I thank the witnesses once again and can I allow a short suspension for a witness changeover? Thank you. Good morning. We now resume our meeting of the committee. Um, agenda item four is access to Scotland's major urban railway stations. The committee will take evidence for this piece of work on access to Scotland's major urban railways. And I also wish to acknowledge at this stage the incredible response to the committee's survey with close to 5,000 responses received. 
committee is very encouraged indeed uh, by the interest in this piece of work uh, from members of the public and other interested stakeholders. And we'd like to thank all of those who took part in the survey. A detailed analysis of the survey responses will be produced uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, can I welcome Anne McLean, convener, and Hussein Patwa, member of Mobility and Access of the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. Can I welcome Jolyn Warren, Head of Research at Transform Scotland, and Robert Sampson, Passenger Manager at Transport Focus. Um, two of our witnesses this morning have a visual impairment, so I'm going to introduce myself and ask members of the committee to do likewise. So I'm Jim Eady, and I'm the convener of the committee. And James Dornan. I'm Mike McKenzie, MSP for Highlands and Islands. I'm David Stewart, I'm Labour MSP for Highlands and Islands. Mary Fee, Labour MSP for West Scotland. Alec Johnston, member from North East Scotland. OK, thank you. Um, well, I'll kick off, if I may, with the first question, and that is to ask the, the witnesses um, in the context of the survey that's been issued by the committee. Um, respondents to this have highlighted a situation where provision for onward travel from major railway stations is often confusing for passengers with limited information often poor signage and bus stops and taxi access, often located um, far from station entrances. I would be interested to know what your perspective is on this and how you think this situation has come about and what um, should be done to prioritise uh, addressing and improving matters in the future. Who would like to kick off? If, if I can kick off Robert Sampson, Transport Focus. Over the years, there's been significant improvement in accessibility at stations, both major and small stations. Uh, we've been involved in that work with Transport Scotland, Network Rail, Scott Rail, and it is to be welcomed. But one thing that we have noticed throughout that time is that it seems to be done in silos to a certain extent, that the rail industry is concerned about accessibility improvements at the station, and it ends at the station entrance or exit to the station. What there needs is a more joined up approach with regional transport partnerships, local authorities to look at connectivity, walking routes to the station from the bus stop or bus station, various things like that, lighting, etc. There seems to be a lack of a joined up approach to actually look at this uh, in a more holistic manner. In the, in the current, in the new franchise agreement, there's a number of improvements to be made at stations. And one of the issues that we're taking forward with high trans improvements have to be made at Inverness station is to actually do a survey of the passengers at the, at the station and who use the bus stops as well to look at connectivity, to look at what the problems are just now to actually inform the spend going forward to improve the facilities at that station. I think there has been a number of accessibility improvements, but I think there needs to be a more joined up approach to the journey just doesn't start or end at the station entrance, and that seems to be the problem going problem just now, to be honest with you. Who else would like to Yes, I you've we've got we put in written evidence. But something we didn't mention, which I think is, is quite important in relation to the question you asked. There is, in Scotland, and in fact across the United Kingdom as a whole, uh, a thing called passenger assist. Um, you ring up in advance, uh, I think it's two hours now, um, and you can get assistance at the railway station. And it's not just for people with disabilities, but it is predominantly people with disabilities who use it. Um, now, it's, it is an excellent system. I've used it for about, I don't know, almost 20 years probably. But the problem is that, and I, I, I'll use an example of, say, Haymarket. Um, the, the passenger assist staff are not supposed to work outside the curtilage of the station. Now, if you're at Haymarket, which I use as an example, the taxi rank is across the tram track, the other side of the road. Now, you might be lucky, waving your arms around, and the taxi might see you. On the other hand, you might not. Now, some of the staff will, although it's not within, they're not, I don't think they're supposed to, because there's all sorts of concerns about insurance and liability, um, do it for you. I think, that would, for, certainly for disabled people, 
if something could change so that passenger assist could help disabled passengers and others. I mean, because if it's good for disabled passengers, it's good for people with heavy luggage, it's good for people with children and families and what have you, um, to, to get to where they need to go to get their, their next mode of transport, be it a taxi, a tram or a bus. That would help. I assume that probably means that there's got to be some work done on liability and insurance, but I don't think that's beyond the wit of not just the rail industry, but the bus industry and local authorities and what have you as well. That would make a great difference. Um, I'll, I'll just give two examples, I think, uh, at this stage. I mean, one we did uh, last year, we completed a, a study called the Interchange Project, which was looking at cycle integration with um, public transport. But you know, a lot of the issues we found actually mirror some of the issues that, that Max raised in their submission as well, which is the lack of consistency with signage and, and such. And I think we found, to echo some of what's been said, that it's the, this, these boundary issues. And there's pretty much every major station that we saw, this becomes a significant issue. You can look at Aberdeen, for instance, where you've got um, Scott Rail, you've got the City Council, you've got the developers that own Union Square, you've got the North, um, North Link, which actually runs the ferry terminal if you're looking at getting from the stations to the ferry terminal. And there seems to be no mechanism to enable sort of efficient coordination between the various bodies that, that need to work together to provide that seamless experience. And I, th I think the second example I just want to mention now is the Queen Street redevelopment in Glasgow and a year ago we submitted a response to the consultation on the plans and one of the points we made we said this the project needs to have much greater focus on improving the station's integration with other public transport services and the response we got from Network Rail Scotland was if I can just uh, excuse me Strategic transport integration is out with the remit of Network Rail has in terms of redeveloping the station. Now that may be, but it's it, it's just, you know this is a, this is a huge amount of public money. Let's not forget that it's public money that is redeveloping Queen Street Station, and to have a situation where the body responsible for de, for doing the redevelopment says, "Well, we'll make a nice station. It's not our problem to figure out how that integrates." Is it's just it's not viable if we want to actually have a really good, high-quality public transport infrastructure. Thank you. That's certainly a, a point that we'll be putting to Network Rail when they appear uh, before the committee. Um, Mr. Patwa, do you have anything you wish to add at this stage? Thank you, Convener, members of the committee. Um, you know, my colleague Anne has already raised the importance of service uh, with regard to assistance for disabled people. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit, if I may, about the, the infrastructure. Um, I would respectfully submit to committee that the infrastructure at many of our urban stations does not lend itself to be used efficiently and effectively by disabled people or anyone for that matter. Uh, I will draw on Aberdeen as an example, that being my home station. You have a very busy shopping complex that you must navigate through that has varying obstructions, varying lighting, um, and the orientation to get from the railway station to the bus station. And when you get to the bus station to go on to your onward mode of transport, um, uh, colleagues have already spoken about the importance of connectivity. Um, I'll cite another example of poor infrastructure, and that is at Stirling. Uh, the bus station is within the line of sight of the railway station. However, you must cross a busy access road. Um, when I checked out a few days ago, uh, there is no ground level uh, indicators to show the crossing point um, where it is safe to do so in order to line up correctly with the point on the other side of the road to access to the bus station. If you don't orientate yourself correctly, you risk walking off the slip road. Uh, which leads down to the, the underpass at that point. And there are varying examples of uh, distances, walking distances, poor markings that can be cited at many stations. So I think whereas um, one can look to attitudinal adjustment to provide service, I think one must also look at the physical 
uh, ground level obstructions that, that may pose a hindrance to connectivity between intermodal change. Thank you. Um, Alec, you have some questions. Yes, thanks very much, Convener. The first question I wanted to ask is a fairly simple one, and that is how proactive are Network Rail and Scott Rail uh, with organisations about needs? There is an organisation called the Scottish Rail Accessibility Forum, on which Network Rail and Scott Rail sit, as do Max and a number of other disabled organisations, including the Scottish Disability Equality Forum, which is the overarching body of all local access panels, and SATA, which is a, a pressure group, the Scottish Accessible Transport Alliance. And we all sit round that, that table. So we do have regular meetings with both Scott Rail and Network Rail. So I am not criticising either body for not consulting with us. It's what happens when we... I'll give you an example, um, and it's something very dear to Hussein's heart, I have to say. When the, the work was being done at Waverley, one of the things that we asked for was ground-level lighting. Hussein made the point at the meeting that a lot of visually impaired people tend to look downwards. And therefore, it, having lighting, you know, to help you around at ground level is very useful. Because Waverley Station is a historic monument, comes under Historic Buildings Scotland, um, they told us that that would spoil the aesthetics of the building. I leave you with that comment. Then that uh, if you've got a historic building, you have to indulge yourself in historic practices. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Um, but I mean that is that is literally. I mean we we have have it in in writing. Well, in the minutes of a meeting, that is what um, Network Rail said because Net Rail, sorry, Network Rail manage um, Waverley Station. They only manage two stations: Waverley and Queens. No Central. Um, the rest are all managed by Scott Rail. How responsive are they? Uh, when you bring a subject up, uh, even if they understand it, how quickly can they act? I think sometimes they act fairly quickly. I mean, one of the things, and I keep going on about Waverley, because at one point Waverley was a nightmare, and I'm not saying it has improved all that much. But one of the things that we were looking for, for instance, you know you have to go up and down in lifts and across the bridge and the rest of it. It's very long for people with especially physical mobility problems. And we asked for seating. There's now seating outside both lifts. There's still no seating, however, at the Carlton Road drop-off point. And also there's no shelter at the Carlton Road drop-off mm. point. But they are going to put in seating on the route from the Carlton Road drop-off point to the concourse. I, I'm waiting to see it, but... Actually, I'm, I'm sure because they put the other seating in that they will actually do so. So there are times when they are quite responsive, but there are other times where they just... And, and, and it's not necessarily network rail or indeed Scott rail. It's sometimes the problem with the interface with another body, so it can be a local authority. I mean, we had endless problems as Max finding out who actually owned the land outside Haymarket Station when Haymarket Station was being, you know, mm. because Haymarket Station is a very good station now. But we eventually found, after weeks, that it, actually the land belonged to Edinburgh City Council. But it was so difficult to find out. Now, that sort of thing is very frustrating because things that could improve, and it doesn't always need, you know, a lot of spend, just needs a bit of thought get delayed because you don't know who you're actually trying to talk to. Mm -hmm. We heard a moment ago about issues of coordination and responsibilities, uh, but both Network Rail and Scott Rail are largely funded through Transport Scotland. Yes. Do Transport Scotland do enough to coordinate? Well, it's actually Transport Scotland that provide the Secretariat for the Scottish Rail Accessibility Forum, and I have to say that the dealings I've had, and I can only speak for Max, with the um, rail directorate, I think they do as much as they can. Um, because the rail directorate can help up to a point, and so can 
the, the sponsor division for the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. But at the end of the day, it is Network Rail and ScotRail who take the decisions. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, two points. I think it's, it's sometimes even difficult to talk about, say, Network Rail as a whole. Um, going back to Waverley again, when, when we were looking at it, there was a lot of very good um, changes being made by the station manager in the station um, and particularly for cyclists things like putting repair kits in better cycle parking all that sort of thing and then network rail I don't know network rail Scotland or if it was network rail down in London made the decision to close off the access ramps and until that point the station uh, team there had actually been developing the north ramp as a specific cycle route into the station and then suddenly both access ramps are closed to bikes and it you know undermines the work the, the very good work that had been done at the station and so there's clearly been issues even within a single organization um, and I, I think the second point I want to make is that in some ways it's difficult to answer the question because we now have the the beginning of this new network rail Scott rail alliance um, and we hope that 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 is the answer to the question and that, that we will see much better coordination between ScotRail and Network Rail and, and also hopefully more responsiveness because I think our experience has been on the ground at individual stations, um, not just at Waverley, the station managers and the teams running the stations are very responsive and very friendly and helpful. It's when you get up into the sort of corporate levels of Network Rail um, and, you know, the, the response to the, the Queen Street consultation and their engagement with us on that is another example that it, it's just been a block. And hopefully the new Scott Rail Alliance will see a, a more um, sort of engaged network rail and taking that, that aspect from the Scott Rail uh, side of things. Uh, the, uh, the new Scott Rail fr franchise that Abelio will have... Mm. Yes, one, but, and it, but you know, there's you see this, the opportunities arising to take a different approach. Because there's this, uh, as they call it, deep alliance between Network Rail and, and Abellio Scott Rail, where there'll be a, an overall management team for both organ Net Network Rail Scotland and Abellio Scott Rail. Um, so hopefully, with one um, one managing director and management team overseeing both organisations, there'll be a more coordinated and, and engaged approach. Is there a role for stronger direction from Transport Scotland uh, in coordinating at that higher level? Um, I wouldn't like. I wouldn't like to say before we see how the alliance works out. I mean, in a sense, Transport Scotland was was obviously instrumental in specifying the franchise, awarding the franchise, and working out the details with the franchise uh, with, with the Bellio and presumably Network Rail Scotland. So I think what we can say is that Transport Scotland has, uh, I, I don't know what, uh, you know, who whose idea it was to create the Deep Alliance, but Transport Scotland has certainly facilitated that and made sure it's happened. So I think at this stage, as before we see how the Alliance works out, I would say, we wouldn't want to say, you know, Transport Scotland should be doing more because maybe this is what needs to be done and that will be sufficient or more you know more than sufficient thank you okay um mr samson do you have anything to add? Uh, yes uh, transport focus sits on the scottish rail accessibility forum uh, as well uh, just listening to the evidence maybe that's not a, maybe part of the problem is the name the scott uh, the scottish rail accessibility forum transport scotland network rail and scott rail should not be a Scottish Transport Accessibility Forum with more partners involved in that. We're talking about connectivity, uh, bus, bus companies, regional transport partnerships involved at appropriate times. Because again, if it's a Scottish Rail Accessibility Forum, we're looking at accessibility issues in a, in a, in a silo to a certain extent. I know that there's been a, a recent accessibility conference that's taken those issues for, forward, but I, I think this is a way, a new way of actually looking at it, rather than looking at a rail accessibility, uh, looking at overall transport accessibility. And if I could mention uh, the issue on Glasgow Queen Street, uh, we were also concerned at the formal consultation network rail, but since then we've worked with network rail and ScotRail, and only today 
uh, been published on our website as a survey of what passengers want out of the Queen Street redevelopment. There's over a thousand passengers been surveyed uh, by ourselves saying what what's what's it like the station just now catch one form the redevelopment and also looking at accessibility issues on it. And also going forward, there is now a partnership group involving Network Rail, Scott Rail, the Buchanan Partnership, SPT and Glasgow City Council. So they're all sitting around one table now, so hopefully lessons have been learned from Edinburgh and other issues so that Queen Street will actually deliver what passengers want. Can I just say something, something about the idea of having a, a, a transport accessibility forum? There is a Roads for All forum as well, and there's also a bus stakeholder group. Right, so there's three. Now, the, the two forums are, are external bodies. The, the bus stakeholder group is a, an internal um, Transport Scotland committee on which Max sits, and, and so does um, CPT, and sorry, the Confederation of Passenger Transport, and the Community Transport Association, and, and indeed others. The, something we have learned since the, the um, Tra the Accessible Transport Summit, which most people found very useful and very productive, is how we then take forward, and the reason I say we, is that it is the Max sponsor team that actually organised it and ran it in, in conjunction with Inclusion Scotland. And there is now a steering group set up on which Max sits, as do other disabled organisations, and indeed Patrick and I'm not going to try and pronounce his surname, the um, Equalities and Access Officer for ScotRail, um, and indeed um, George Mayer from um, Confederation and Passenger Transport, they all sit on it. And we're looking at how we can take forward accessible transport issues and also the infrastructure that supports it, because it's you know we're talking about bus stations and train stations and roads and pavements and everything like that because quite frankly it's not just the public transport part of it if when you go out of your house if you have a disability and that's you know as I say physical sensory or cognitive if the way for you to get to your nearest bus stop is bad pavements no um, no um, Sorry, I've forgotten where I am. No, no um, bubble paving, you know, to show you where you're at a crossing. Um, if, if none of those things are there, then quite frankly, it's why a lot of disabled people don't leave their house. So it's, it's everyone having to work together. And the local authorities were also at the, at the Accessible Transport Summit because um, a number of local authorities and indeed COSLA. And I'm, we are hoping that what will come out of the steering group following that conference is a more joined up way of looking at it at at transport accessibility I, 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 I we've only had one meeting so I'm not going to predict anything coming out of it at the moment and it's going to depend on the goodwill and the time of all the people who are sitting around the table so I mean in a sense I hope you know what okay. what Robert's just said there might be some steps you know being taken Thank you. Alex, do you have any further questions? Okay, thank you. Mary, you have some questions. Yes, thank you. Convener, can I um, start by asking you about signage? Because signage, both within and around stations, is of crucial importance to help passengers do their, move on with their onward journey and also find their, their, their platform. Um, so, what improvements could be made to signage within stations to help um, People particularly with visual, visual impairments get, get around. And are there any examples of good practice that the committee should be aware of? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for, first of all, uh, for recognising the, the importance of signage. And um, I, I, could, I could lax lyrical um, all day about <laughs> examples of signage. I'll attempt not to. But um, I think the, the first point I say about signage is the environment in which the signage is located is variable. So, for example, you could give me a large print sign with good contrast here and now, and I'll come and tell you that's excellent. I can just about make out the sign. Take it outside into the corridor there. The lighting conditions are completely different. We've got natural light which comes into play. That sign suddenly may become unreadable. And this was one of the points that I made to 
network rail consultants when they were looking at signage in Waverley back in 2013. And I said, you have to perform the testing in a variety of conditions. Summer, winter, lighting levels fluctuate. That has a big impact on, on particularly visual impairment, as you, as you pointed out there, ability to use signage. The, the other issue is, um, as you addressed there, the, the lack of appropriate signage, and particularly for intermodal change. So if we look at Perth Station, for example, which we've cited in our written submission, um, the bus station is about a 10-minute walk away from Perth Station. Mm -hmm. The lay-by for long-distance coaches is even further away. Um, I have yet to be told that there is signage in Perth that tells you, A, which station one must use, depending on one's final destination, B, which services go from that station, and C, how to get there. And even the signage to connect between a rail station and a bus station is either non-existent or very unreliable. And for disabled passengers, also for passengers who are not familiar with the local landscape, that has a big impact on their ability to confidently connect. And let us remember that a desire of many disabled people is to be as independent as possible. And if they are able to manage signage without assistance, that signage must be of satisfactory quality. Um, because of my level of visual impairment, I'm perhaps not the best person for a committee to cite examples of good practice. What I will say, though, is any, any attempt to look at signage or regulate signage, create standards, etc., must put disabled people and the people that will use that signage at the heart of the matter and at the centre of the planning. Um, it would not do to simply take a, a series of what appear to be logical guidelines when the implementation in practice may well result in that signage not working. And I think that's one point which the rail industry and indeed all transport needs to take up that it's always more cost effective, more useful and more efficient if we can tackle problems at the outset rather than waiting until we have implementation, which could result in a very costly redesign. So, can can I just, just, sorry, can I just say one other thing? Mm -hmm. It also has to be at different levels, because remember, mm. where somebody standing sees it is in one place, where somebody sitting in a wheelchair sees it has to be in another. Mm. I think that's very important. So do transport organisations not currently consult with people with disabilities in relation to signage in stations? Because I, I use Glasgow Central Station um, quite often, and if I think of the signage at Glasgow Central, some of it's very high up, some of it's very low down. Um, some of it is, frankly, quite confusing. And it's very difficult to follow where, you, where you're, you're meant to go, particularly if there's late platform changes or if your train is at the front of a platform or at the rear of a platform. Um, and something that came to mind um, just as b before committee started this morning, and again, it's particularly in, in relation to Glasgow Central, if the weather is particularly bad, and in Scotland we all get, we, we get a lot of very bad weather, the concourses get very wet and very slippy. And the signage for slippage is quite often a, an A-board, um, which is situated on top of the slippy bit. Um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts on how that could be improved <coughs> as well. You just highlighted an issue which I raise all the time at, with um, Scarf at the Station. And I've often wondered, if, if I may, um, you know, pardon the, uh, the humour here, but why do we have yellow signs indicating slippage on a white or cream floor tiling. For, from my point of view, that would appear to be poor judgment for appropriate contrast. And I just wonder, I can't see the signs because I have no central vision, <coughs> the number of people that must walk into the signs, trip over them, and is that not the very thing we're attempting to avoid by putting the signs there? And, and I do recall, if I may, committee, one day saying to my local station staff, if I could come in with a tin of black paint and outline the signs in black so that we may actually see where they are. Uh, and, and I just wonder about the, uh, the rationale behind that. I think a number of stations do work with their local access panels. Um, in fact, I know they do, because I, I, I live in the Highlands, and I know that my local station, stations, um, Abbey Moore, Newton Moore, can you see, and what have you, some of which are unstaffed, do work with their local access panel. But there are occasions when things are done based from Inverness where they don't, because it's somebody from Inverness that's coming to do something at Abbeymore Station, and they don't.
talk to the local access fund. It's about just reminding people that that's what access... I mean, max, you know, there are 15 of us and we work for one day a month. Oh, sorry, I work for two, but the rest work for one. There's no way we can cover all the stations in Scotland. That's what local access panels are there for. And they actually have a lot of very good information. Something that Max can do to help them is actually provide um, the sort of information they, they might need to help them do that job more efficiently. Anyone else have any further comments? Uh, what the captain's saying is generically the there is a code of practice and I think it runs into about three or four hundred pages about uh, accessibility at, stage, at stations and it gives guidance on signage. Uh, I think it previously it was a, the, the documents in the midst of time because it was the Strategic Rail Authority who originally produced it. But prior to that, there was a consultation inclu which included the Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Committee. So there are standards there. There is a document there, but it, it doesn't meet everyone's individual uh, needs, as has been pointed out by the other witnesses. But there are a generic set of standards or guidelines in place. Is there a process in place to update that guidance and standards? Yes, there is a process in place. I believe it's the responsibility of the Department for Transport because accessibility is a, a, a GB-wide matter and they're responsible for updating that code of practice, practice and uh, consultation. And they, and they the Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Committee, which is the UK... I was going to say the UK equivalent of Max. No, I ought to say Max is the UK, is the Scottish equivalent of the tag. But no, I like it. I, I prefer it the way I said it. Yes. yes. <laughs> and how often is that updated then? Do you, I, do you I, I would have to consult. Max has a member on the Disabled Persons Transport Advice Committee. I would have to seek advice on that, but I'm very happy to do so and let the committee know. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing that was highlighted in, in evidence was the difficulty in managing across station concourses um, when stations are, are, are quiet because of the, the, the large open spaces or again when stations are unmanned and barrier gates are left open. So how could improvements be made to help that situation? This is one I run across of. I will take this one if I may. Um, the, the principal problem with open spaces is the way in which um, and I will comment from a VI perspective, I have no doubt that other disabilities may, have, may be affected likewise, but is the process of wayfinding by landmarks and waypoints. So if, if one takes a parallel with a GPS system, one might decide to go from point A to point B and then point C until they reach the final destination. Um, I and I've, I've, I've known that many others use a similar process that I will enter the station, make my way to a certain point, a landmark, it could be W. H. Smith, for example, and then turn right and walk across the station from W. H. Smith to the next point. When you couple large open spaces with reduced uh, reduce long distance vision, that process breaks down. And it's, it's a bit of a balancing act because what you don't want to do is make the station so crowded it affects with the pedestrian flow. But equally, as I've just said here, you want to have this landmarking ability so one can do that. I think that's a question of taking it on a case-by-case -case basis on the local infrastructure. And it could be something as simple as changing the contrast. So your, your pillars, for example, your, your um, supporting pillars, become more visible. One can use that as a landmark, or it could be the way in which the lighting is arranged to give someone to latch onto. Um, actually, a lot of stations are very good when it comes to barrier gates being open because there is a change of tactile surface. Mm -hmm. But one also has to remember that not everyone will be skilled um, in the ways of being able to use these techniques. Not everyone uses a long cane. Um, a lot of uh, visually impaired people, people with autism, those who um, have difficulty reading signage, for example, learning difficulties, learning difficulties mm -hmm. may find themselves vulnerable to risk uh, appearing on a platform that looks unstaffed. Uh, I think these are risks which have to be managed on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the usage of the station um, and the staff rotors. Um, but certainly it is an issue and it is a problem. And if, if I may divulge just very briefly, at a time when the, there has been um, 
there has been talk on the grapevine about increasing the number of unmanned stations and reducing the hours at which manned stations are manned. Um, this is certainly a major concern for the future in terms of accessibility and the, the ability to, to independently use um, our rail infrastructure. C can I just finally ask you about lighting? Because you've touched on lighting a couple of times in, in the answers that you've given. And if I think of Glasgow Central and Glasgow Queen Street stations in particular, where they have an upper level station and a lower level station, and when you go from the upper level, which is very bright, and on the journey down to the lower level, it becomes dark. And the level of lighting in the lower level is at a, a different level to the upper. How much of a problem is that? And is it just simply a case of making a standard, a standard brightness of lighting throughout the station? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a problem not just for visually impaired people, but... I mean, we, we've spoken very little about cognitive mm. disability. And I think that things like lighting and signage is a real problem for people with cognitive difficulties who want to live as independent mm. lives as they can. You know, if you have a, a learning disability or if you have autism and you cannot relate to the, to the place that you're in, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then things like good signage and consistent signage and consistent lighting is actually very important. Mm. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that? No? Okay, thank you, Convener. James. Uh, you've already <coughs> mentioned on a number of occasions the problems you have where passengers travelling between rail and bus stations and either can't receive assistance or receive assistance through the goodwill of the staff. How, f further from what you've said earlier on, is there any other ways that you can see this situation being remedied? For example, that uh, partnership group that you were talking about, Mr Sampson from Queen Street, would that type of idea, would it be a good idea to have that replicated around most, if not all, stations where the local authorities the bus services and the uh, train services are, are brought together? I, I, I believe well, there's a number of uh, improvements planned for stations. You've got to get everyone involved, not just the rail industry, but the local authority, uh, the bus operator, even you know, the local taxi firm as well, because they, they all have, they all have their, their part to play. Uh, on the particular issue of passenger assist, which Anne mentioned earlier, uh, Transport Focus carries out a survey of passenger assist with ScotRail and with every other train operating company in Great Britain to see how it actually performs, uh, if the service actually delivers what people require. And to be fair, most of the time it does. It works very well, and when we point out when it doesn't, then the, the rail industry are quick to point it out. But one of the criticisms we've had from the passengers who use passenger assist is, yeah, as Anne pointed it's great. It's a wonderful system. We have confidence in the rail staff. They're friendly. They're efficient. They're helpful. But I'm left 10 yards outside the railway station, and I don't know where to go after that, or I'm, I'm left to corrupt what's been pointed That's one of the things that has been borne out in our evidence, yes. That's, that's exactly the sort yes. of thing I'm, I'm suggesting yes. should so be agree. discussed at such a, such a forum. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Warren. Um, well, it just relates to that, one of the recommendations that came out of, of our interchange project was that, that thought should be given to create, uh, we called it an active travel friendly standard, but some, some standard, and this wasn't just about cyclists, but about people, pedestrians as well. And it was specifically also not that, you know, you would uh, do lots of great work at the station and then you get the badge, but that it requires the, 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 the overall area and, and the sort of wider consideration. And something along those lines needs to be done because that addresses, it addresses things like um, consistent signage, both within stations, but then once you get out, providing not just good signage between uh, different transport modes, but actually thinking through those links and making sure that they are convenient and accessible. And it would also, um, it would encourage the, the sort of coordination between bodies. So there's a balance, obviously, you know, it's, you don't want new standards, new certification programs for everything because it, it becomes, unmanageable but uh, there is also I think an argument to be made to say 
we have these problems with uh, the sort of silos of, of different work being done, different varying standards um, within cities, between cities and all that, and why don't we look at, at what we'd like to see as a, as a high quality standard across Scotland and put in place a mechanism whereby we can, we can recognize when that's happened and that that includes uh, not individual facilities but but sort of working together to provide these these high quality environments for pedestrians, for cyclists, and and all all people that that encompasses. So. Okay. Uh, Mr. McLean, would you want to come in? No, Mr. Partwa. Um, I think the only thing I would say is I, I would support um, the partnerships and working between bodies and between different modes of transport. Um, I think it's in everybody's interest to make the system as usable as possible. Uh, disabled people do wish to travel, and that doesn't stop simply at the entrance to the railway station, and simply because rail is a very accessible means of travel. Um, and I would absolutely support the involvement of disabled people in that partnership, um, so that we, we, we spread the onus and we, we spread the responsibility um, towards providing uh, an efficient and, and meaningful and useful service to our disabled travellers. If I may, convener, this committee used to be called the Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee when I first appeared before it, it's a long time ago now. But it, it's interesting because we've been talking about, you know, the passenger, the traveller, but, but in actual fact, anything that the transport industry and local authorities can do to encourage the use of public transport is good for Scotland's climate change um, aims. And do, I mean, I think we, we all right, we, because we're, we're from Max, we've been concentrating on the disabled traveller, but there is a wider perspective, and that is encouraging people to use good quality public transport. And in order to do that, you have to get the connectivity, connectivity right. Can I just uh, go on then to the matter of taxi ranks? Uh, how is the accessibility to taxi ranks? I mean, I can only speak for Glasgow, I think, which is not bad. I mean, the likes of just now, anyway, at Queen Street, and, and the upper level, I'm not so sure about the lower level, but in the upper level, you go straight out to the taxi rank. Uh, but I can't really speak for too many of the other stations. I know that with the changes, it might be slightly different. But, but uh, you're shaking your head, Ms McLean. Would you like to respond first? It varies all <laughs> over Scotland, I suppose. I mean, we, ha we have barely touched on the um, removal of access to cars and, and taxis to Waverley Station. In actual fact, we were told that it was the UK government, under security measures, that taxis were banned from Waverley, and taxis and cars were banned from Waverley. But I've heard all sorts of different stories since, so who knows. But... Take Waverley, taxis used to be able to kin. They're now, it's now at Carlton Road. I've already complained about that. There's no shelter, there's no seats. And if you're waiting for your assistance, it's, you, know, you can be there for some time. That's not the fault of the assistance people. Please don't misunderstand me, but they get there as quick as they can. Um, the taxi rank at, at Market Street is um, on the left-hand side. We're told it's going to change to the right-hand side. So the first taxi is, near, is nearer to the station exit, whereas at the moment it can be all the way up the road. Um, Inverness, which is another one I know, now there are spaces for three taxis in, 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 the, in the station square. If there's no taxis there, you have to walk two sides of the square and along Academy Street to get to the taxi rank. Now for somebody, and by the way the pavements are shocking, but that's a different issue. Now for somebody who, is, who has a mobility problem <coughs> or in a wheelchair, or visually impaired, whatever the disability, or even if you're carrying a lot of luggage or you have young children in pushchairs, it's a long way to go. And it just, you know, that's... To be fair, there usually are three in, the, in this little sort of semi-circle. Um, I can sort of... Yes, well, we, we talked about Haymarket, where the taxi rank is right at the other side of the road. Um, you would have to cross the tram lines and the road to get to the taxi rank. Um, Perth is just outside, I think. 
Yes, it's just outside. Stirling is on the other side of the road sometimes, but sometimes there's a few taxis on the same side as the station, but you never know. Um, what other places have we looked at? Um, if, if I may just address Aberdeen here. We have, a, we have an issue um, in Aberdeen whereby the, the station is a taxi rank, which is underneath the station roof, it's on the station premises. Yes, it it's, it's not a problem. The issue we do have is um, taxi firms must apply for a permit to use the taxi rank. Now, uh, one of the, the, the larger taxi companies in Aberdeen have decided that they don't wish to pay for the permit, which is unscannable. Um, their pickup point is technically out with the station premises. So you have the issue which we've colleagues have already touched on regarding the insurance and the liability of the assistance to get you to that point. You also have an issue of security. Um, because that point is not within the station, it's on, on council of land, um, it's just outside the shopping centre. You have uh, teenagers, young people, people going out, hanging around on a, on a Friday night. Um, it's not the most confident uh, area that one could wait for a taxi firm. Um, and not probably not the safest pickup point either, because one must cross an access road that does not have a man crossing. Um, and it's also on a blind spot for vehicles. So at that particular point, we have two issues whereby, yes, there's a provision of a taxi rank, but it's not entirely usable um, or accessible, uh, and that's down to the whims of the taxi company, whether they wish to use it or not. Does this not highlight any the requirement for the different bodies to be working together to make sure there's a joined-up approach to it? Absolutely. And I mean, even the installation of a control crossing at that point would inspire confidence. One could at least get across that access road to, to wait for their taxi to pick them up. Mm. The, the infrastructure changes logically, and I don't profess to be an expert in infrastructure, but they don't seem to be significantly vast. But the rewards and the returns uh, would certainly lend themselves to a more usable environment. Okay. Queen Street. Queen Street, yes. Queen Street's a good example of actually a good taxi rank. Yes, yes, it's yes, on the right, flat, yeah. you walk out, right. the, 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 the left, sorry if you're facing, you walk out the left hand side, and the taxis are there, and you're undercover. That is a really good example of a really accessible taxi rank. <coughs> Mr. McLean, Mr. Parkwell, I think you deserve full marks for um, seeking to provide us with and the committee with an overview of taxi facilities at all of the stations uh, in Scotland. But can I bring you back to Edinburgh Waverley, which is of course the, the station that serves the, the capital city as the gateway for the whole of Scotland. Uh, can I ask what level of consultation was there with your committee um, prior to Network Rail imposing the ban on vehicle access to Waverley Station, either in terms of the initial ban or the reimposition of that ban which had been lifted there temporarily? Was, there was no consultation with us at all. We were told, and it, and it came from, it, I as I understand it, the Department of Transport, that taxis were going... That, oh, by the way, Waverley was the only station where there was taxi and vehicle access right into the station. Whether that's true or not, I do not know. Um, but it was to be banned. And as I say, we were originally told it was on security grounds. But it, the direction came from at UK level. So there was no consultation. And I, I think... Um, Sorry, there's somebody else gave evidence, um, an MSP, Sarah Boyack, and I, because she's obviously had complaints as a, as a local MSP about it, and I think she too says that there was no, and as far as we know, there was no consultation with the Edinburgh Access Panel, because one of our um, colleagues on the MAX committee is also on the Edinburgh Access Panel. Just, just to reassure you, we will be uh, raising that issue directly with Network Rail when they appear before us, so that's why I was very keen uh, to have your views on the record this morning. Um, in terms of um, disabled access uh, to the taxi ranks that have been relocated at Market Street and Calton Road, um, how difficult or onerous has that been for disabled passengers? So, in particular, um, what are the what is your view on the signage um, arrangements that have been put in place? And also, Network Rail have highlighted that they've made an, an investment in infrastructure in terms of um, lifts at either side of the station to improve access for disabled people. Do you think that that arrangement is one that is working or not? Well, there's no taxi rank at Carlton Road. It's merely a, a drop-off point. Or if you, if you know 
of a number, a taxi number, you can ring it and that's where they'll pick you up. But a lot of people passing through Edinburgh do not have the telephone number for a, an Edinburgh taxi. Um, Market Street, as I say, is it's a long walk, but they have put seats in where you have to wait for the lifts. N not not on, is it what's that long platform? Platform 19? platform nineteen. Right, not on platform nineteen, which is where you wait for the lift. You know, if you're going up up from the concourse, um, and then you have to walk across the bridge, and then there's another two lifts, and it's a bit complicated. And actual facts. I only know my way around because I happen to know my way around, if you see what I mean. You know, you use the station often enough. and you. Know. I do not know how people who do not know Waverley Station and want to get to Market Street, because as far as I know, and I, I agree I'm visually impaired, I do not know, and somebody may know better, whether there's signage within Waverley Station that says the taxi rank is at Market Street. And I don't think there is. And I tell you something else, and this is absolutely true. Oh, it's, ane it's anecdotal, I suppose. But I was I was travelling with the the um, the head of the of of Max's sponsor team back back from a meeting, and we met a woman standing outside um, the Market Street entrance to Waverley Station, and she she had a stick, and she saw me with my stick and my guide dog. And she said, oh, do you know how I get down? The lift isn't working. Now, I can manage with the dog and the stick to get down the steps, but the lift wasn't working. Now, this is something we have asked Network Rail about, <laughs> about what their contingency plans are when the lifts don't work. Now, this is the person, and uh, yes, I am going to say it, because the, the, the head of... I think it's the head of Network Rail Scotland. I might be wrong, I would have to check. Says that Waverley is now more accessible than it has ever been. I have not met a disabled person that agrees with that statement. And if we have asked what contingency plans there are in the event of the lifts being out of action, and the answer is that they will be um, repaired very quickly. Now, that may be all right if you, a train that you want to get runs every quarter of an hour. If, like me, you live in the Highlands and the trains are every two hours, if you miss a train, you've got two hours until the next one. Not funny. And I think it's... I really do think that... that Waverley... Oh, the other answer is, of course, there are also escalators. Well, there are in certain places... But I usually travel with a guide dog, and I'm sorry, you can't take a guide dog on a, a, an escalator. You may have seen these signs in London, you know, dogs and pushchairs, what should we carry? I don't fancy carrying my guide dog, I have to tell you. He's a very large, flat Labrador. Um, but it, there is no satisfactory answer. If there is a breakdown and you're at Carlton Road, the nearest place would be to go around to Market Street. Well, I wouldn't want to walk around it. I wouldn't know where to go. And, I mean, I know Edinburgh reasonably well. If you were... You, I have to say, my choice, when there isn't work on Waverley Bridge, which there is at the moment, is to ask the taxi driver to drop me at the, at the top of the, the ramp at Waverley Bridge and I just walk down. That, to me, is by far the easiest access. But that's not what Network Rail recommends. <coughs> they recommend that anyone accessing the pimp by taxi should be dropped off at Carlton Road and I just don't think I think Carlton Road is the most uncomfortable place it's also dark and unpleasant uh, thank you for that. Can I ask you <laughs> have you asked your members what they would like to see in terms of a, a solution to the the problems that exist at Waverley for do, do they believe that taxis should be readmitted to the station or not it's not something I've asked them but judging by the number of people with disabilities that I speak to, I know that most people say, wasn't it good in the days when the taxi could take you right into Waverley? I mean, th there is absolutely no doubt about that. Would you, Hussein, would you agree? I would absolutely agree. And I think one thing that we must take into account, our committee, if I may, um, is the increasing drain and scraying on resources um, that has happened since the taxi ban was implemented. 
um, in the, the I'm probably too young to use the phrase, but in the good old days when taxis were a wafer, you, you, you know, your taxi dropped you off outside their office, helped you into the door, and you were out of your taxi within perhaps a minute or two at most, and the taxi moved on, and that was that intermodal change was, was sorted. Um, and also, it meant that the number of assists per hour was yeah. significantly higher than it is now. Yeah. Now, I, I will add my um, my plaudits to to colleague Anne here that the, the assist scarf at Waverley and indeed at the other Scottish stations that I've used do a fantastic job, mm. and cannot be held responsible for any usually for any delays that happen. But what it does mean that an assist to a platform which used to take for let's say two minutes now takes roughly seven because of the increased travel time to the taxi rank and back again. Um, very often, if I'm traveling, uh, I find assists are having to manage two or three passengers yes. at once. They may be on trains that are back-to-back -back on the same platform, so they're having to multitask. I'm not saying this reduces the quality of service, but it certainly increases the strain on the scarf involved. Um, so I don't think that the taxi ban generally has helped anybody. I with the utmost respect, cannot agree that it makes Waverley an accessible station. And it, you know, if I had a wish list, I would have the taxis back as was. I accept that there are other competing pressures in terms of the issue around air quality, but yes. I, th I think it's very important that we get the perspective of people um, and I think who, are, who have to, mobility Sorry, Convener, I think you just spoke to people with pushchairs and children and you know, lots of luggage who are perhaps going away on a nice long holiday and they decided to take, you know, something fresh to wear every night. Um, you know, they too struggle. And I mean, I have watched as much as I can people with, you know, double buggies. You know, it's just as bad for them, you know, especially if you've got a toddler in tow as well, you know. Okay, I'm going to seek the indulgence of the committee to ask one. Uh, final question on Waverley, and that is, if you had a message for Network Rail, what would it be? Bring the taxis back in. All right, okay. <laughs> Actually, not just taxis, because to be fair, I suppose a lot of people came to Waverley in their own cars. You know, they were taking some. Now, at the moment, if you if you take a car and you can park in New Street Car Park, um, but it's still a fair fair haul then from the and and you can wait half an hour. Minutes, All right. I was going to increase the waiting time to 40 minutes, 40 minutes, but if your train is delayed and you're helping a passenger into the station now, you know, considering your, your passenger may be frail, for example, what, what takes um, a fit as or perhaps three or four minutes to make their way from car park to platform mm. may take 10 to 20 minutes. Yeah, and, sure. and with the utmost respect committee, I don't exaggerate there. Um, and if your train happens to be running late, um, the person who is assisting you, who may well want to wish an may wish to wait with you until you're safely on board and away, mm. then has to face the issue of perhaps being penalised uh, for something that is you know, not their responsibility and, yeah. and something that they could not perhaps foresee. Yes, um, since we're on Edinburgh uh, Waverley Station and issues of access and signage, uh, could I ask Mr Samson on you've obviously done work transport focus have done work with passengers on uh, assessing the improvements uh, and uh, and the like that have been brought in by network rail um do you have any comment um that you can add to the, these observations that we've received about edinburgh waverley uh, after the, the recent work had been completed at Edinburgh Waverley, we did a survey of about a thousand passengers at Edinburgh Waverley to see what they thought of the improvements. Uh, most of the improvements had been noted and people actually rated the station, were more satisfied with the station, but there were still problems relating to signage and uh, accessibility in terms of the lifts escalators working. But overall, passengers felt it was a, a better station after the investment, obviously, than prior to it. Does the evidence that you've heard here, that was that reflected in, in the passenger surveys as well? Okay. Yeah, the, 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 the evidence is reflected because passengers, you know, 
uh, about taxis, etc., is variable across Scotland. What passengers want is a taxi as close to the station as possible with a, a flat walking surface to, to it. And if um, the situation at Edinburgh Waverley before the change was better for passengers than it is now when you've got to go up steps, lifts, etc., and it's uncovered. So it was better. Passengers do want the, the taxis to be as close to the station entrance as possible. So if you've actually got taxis in the station, it's better for passengers but in that regard. In short, both access and signage issues... Still um, remain. Yeah. It's, a, one, it's not an accessibility issue, but it's still a concern for passengers at the, the late platform changes at Edinburgh Waverley. Getting from one end of Edinburgh to another can result in passengers uh, missing trains, and it would be even worse for the, uh, the the passengers of the Re Mobility Access Committee Scotland are here talking about today, but it's still a great problem, and signage is still a problem at Waverley today, but it has improved. Mr Warren? Yeah. Just, just uh, on Waverley and the changes, I think um, our big concern is, 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 is well, frankly, it's ridiculous that there's two access ramps down uh, with effectively, I mean, a handful of delivery vehicles on one of the ramps and both pedestrians, uh, well, everyone's a pedestrian on the ramp because you obviously can't cycle down, but, you know, people uh, with luggage, people with bikes, people in wheelchairs, people with prams, whatever, are corralled into these narrow walkways with uh, newly resurfaced wide roadways next to them just lying empty and it's... Um, it you know it's astounding and um we we don't have a, a particular view on the taxis but uh certainly i don't see whether taxis are allowed into the station or not there's plenty of space you know we've got two ramps mm -hmm. and why there can't be one of those ramps that has a wide walkway and a two-way cycle lane is, is beyond me because the space is there, the ramps are nice, and you know people both uh, walking or with bikes prefer to be able to just walk into the station without having to traverse square um, stairs and, and lifts. And I think it should also be noticed, noted that the new ScotRail Alliance is uh, going to deliver a cycle hub at Waverley and Aberdeen and at Glasgow, but it would be it would be crazy to deliver a cycle hub in Waverley and have such severely restricted access to the station. Um, and, and I guess the other thing to note is that Network Rail is redeveloping the south ramp or reconfiguring the south ramp because they're extending platform 12. And again, that's an opportunity. So, you know, there's, there's work to be done for a cycle hub. There's work to reconfigure the south ramp. The work's are going to happen anyway. It should be thought through so that the conditions for pedestrians and cyclists are improved to access the station. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy. David. Uh, thank you, Computer Matt. My first question is to Mr. Warren. You've already outlined, I think, uh, some of the recommendations in your interchange uh, uh, project. I was very interested in the recommendations, particularly around the active travel hubs. Could you tell the committee a little bit more information about that? Yeah, um, of course. One of the things we found is that, uh, well, so, sorry. So the 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 idea of active travel hubs is is well is now established in the UK. We've we have um, a handful in Scotland. There's a there's a cycle hub in Stirling, um, and there's one in Pollock Shores West in Glasgow, and they. What they offer varies depending on the location. So you might have a station that is primarily uh, for commuter traffic that provides parking and, and quick repairs, that sort of thing. You might, at bigger stations, have uh, a larger facility that offers sales and um, route, uh, the one at Stirling, for instance, uh, will helps with route planning and provides bicycle hire and that sort of thing. Um, so, so what we're recommending is that's extended not just to cater for cyclists, but 
also to cater for pedestrians, people who arrive in a place and, and want to know, uh, you know, easy ways to get around, whether it's walking around the town or to get to the bus station or, or ferry terminal or, or whatever. But that <coughs> these hubs should enable, and it, it goes back to what Anne was saying about you can't look at, people aren't just going to take the train, they've got to then go somewhere from the train or you, you know, the bus. And so it, it facilitates that by making... Uh, taking away that concern that you arrive somewhere and you don't know where to go and you don't know where to get your your next sort of transport option. Um, and by their nature, these active travel hubs would vary based on stations and they wouldn't all be operated by, you know, we're not suggesting that, say, Transport Scotland operates a network of active travel hubs or ScotRail or whoever. But so ScotRail will have some and, and other providers will have others, but there should be some coordination between them to create effectively a network, a support network for um, pedestrians and cyclists across Scotland so that y you can kind of get passed on, you know, if, if, if you're going a longer distance or you're traveling to another station, you can get recommended on to the next one. You know that you'll have some sort of support in terms of the information and the facilities that, that you require there. You Transport Scotland and you'll be looking for them to then respond to you. Yes, and they 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 have been um, they have been positive in general terms, but I think the issue is, uh, and I, I know there's European funding to develop mm -hmm. uh, travel active travel hubs, and as as I've said, the new ScotRail franchise has that commitment for three main cycle hubs and mm -hmm. some uh, mm -hmm. some smaller facilities at other stations, so. But I think what what's been missing from our standpoint is we've not uh, we've not been asked to engage in the process, and we're not sort of clear mm. on what the process is to mm. use the European funding and mm. how the the active travel hubs, how mm. the concept is being developed by Transport mm. Scotland, and whether while they've been generally positive about the idea of of a network, whether there are any plans to actually create more of a, a comprehensive support network or not. I'm personally very interested in utilising European funding um, and certainly have been nagging Scottish Government about some of the outstanding uh, European funding, say like the 10T and mm. wider things like uh, which involve ferry services like Marco Polo and so on. Yeah. Uh, my belief, although there's matching issues, that there's still a lot more work to be done utilising European funding. Yeah. What about in future franchise uh, arrangements? We've obviously just had recent awards, at least the Sleeper, the London Service and so on. Uh, whether there should be more uh, definition in these franchise agreements which says thou shall be the following hubs and the following stations as a condition in a future franchise. I mean, it, that, that's difficult to say because I, I, I wouldn't want to say, you know, blanket statement Transport Scotland has uh, is better at specifying where the, the hubs should be. And if we look at the existing active travel hubs, those have been done have developed at the local level and are therefore appropriate to, to where they are. So um, certainly the approach that Belio has taken to date um, with its plans has been very much engaging with the various stakeholders to um, understand what the needs are. And that that approach is, is one we welcome. Um, I think there there is potentially more work that can be done um, if we look at other modes of transport, because obviously there's the ferry franchising, and as far as I'm aware, there's no um, impetus for improving cycle provision. In, and I, I know this is slightly out with the remit of what we're discussing here, but it, it does go back to the fact that we look at transport as very segregated, uh, as very segregated modes. And I mean, obviously, bus. The bus system being deregulated makes it much more difficult, but um, bus stations are, are very chaotic in terms of you know, different owners, managers, etc. There's no level of, of standard. So I think that's some. I think it's in 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 these other areas where Transport Scotland should be thinking about how they can bring their influence to bear, so that it's not okay. As long as you know, as long as where you need to go, you can get to by rail. You're okay. But if you've got to change to the bus station or the ferry, then, you know, all bets are off.
point in conscious time committee, but the, certainly that you and McLean mentioned the previous committee, which a number of members were on, and we did a major ferry inquiry. And certainly the consultation we took at places like Oban uh, talked about when the ferry comes in uh, just as the train or the bus has departed. And everyone at transport um, conferences talks a good game about integration. My experience is it doesn't happen that well because partly, as you've mentioned, there's internal integration. In other words, buses have to meet other buses and sometimes talking to other modes uh, doesn't work. And if I give one example, if it's your indulgence, uh, convener, um, I, I thought in the last inquiry we did showed how we don't have integration <coughs> is different modes of travel don't even coordinate when winter ends and summer season starts. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can't get that right, you have a real problem. <laughs> Perhaps the other witnesses would like to comment uh, on the, Mr Warren's comments. I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that no disabled people cycle, mm. but um, it's not. But we do walk. We mm. do walk. Yeah, do most people, most people, most are pedestrians, people, so. yes, are pedestrians. No, I, I, I support what, what he's been saying, hmm. and I do have some. Again, coming back to Waverley, um, I do. Um, it, it, he's, he's right. As I, I think I said, my preferred method of getting into Waverley Station when there's no work being done on the on the bridge is to be dropped off and walk down the, you know, the ramp. And he's right, of course. It's, you know, it's this narrow ramp and you're competing with people coming up as well as going down. And <coughs> there's all this space. I, I, I presume, I may well be wrong, is that the fear is that somebody will try and drive down. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm only assuming. I'm, I'm not here to speak for <laughs> Network Rail. My, my final question, convener. Um, I would just first of all want to flag up the, the work that the committee's done on surveying. Uh, we had almost 5,000 results to our online surveying. I'd like to like, thank the clerks for all the work they've done here. In my experience, that's one of the highest returns that any committee has ever done. So if I can be self-congratulatory, I think I, I will be on this particular one. Uh, but our survey suggests a lack of cycle parking stations and those which are available are not easy to access or particularly secure. Does this chime, Mr Warren, with your research? Yeah, by and large. I mean, there, there's some examples mm. where there is is good cycle parking covered, secure, uh, ample. But by and large, I mean, Aberdeen's actually a good example. There's no cycle parking within the station, despite the fact that there's plenty mm. of space to enable that. And the staff there, uh, the, the local station staff, sort of had heard rumours that maybe it would happen. But, you know, again, it was one of these things that was happening higher up and and doesn't seem to be and then the nearest parking to the station is in a a very dark basically just a dark dank area um and so it's unused but then there is cycle parking in uh union square and in surrounding areas mm -hmm. but completely oversubscribed because the cycle parking that isn't that that feels secure and has uh you know it's convenient things uh you know bikes chained to railings and things like that so that's an example of a major station where it's not even a space issue. It's just it's just not not being done, um, and there's a demand for cycle parking. Um, and yeah, I mean Waverley actually has good quality cycle parking, and um, we didn't uh, manage to audit Glasgow Central. I know there's quite a lot of cycle parking, but last time I was there, anecdotally, it was mm. it was full. So you know, the issue is also of capacity and. Mm. We, we hope, with, again, the cycle commitments in the new Abellio franchise, that, that these issues will be addressed and also that they'll improve the quality at, at the minor stations too. Thank you. And would any other uh, witness like to comment? On the, on, the cycle parking, it's, on the cycle parking, it's a rather like the, the t provision of taxis. It's very variable. But in the last uh, ScotRail franchise operated by First Group, there was a commitment to put cycle uh, facility, cycle parking facilities in most, if not all, ScotRail stations. Now, bearing in mind that a, l a large number of those stations are unmanned <coughs> stations, even putting in the provision, I, I query if that's the best use of the, the funds, because a, a good number of cyclists will not leave their cycle at an unmanned station for a, a large mm -hmm. amount of time. They would rather take it on the train or hire one at the river point. So there's a question there about Adequate, and it's not just providing the facilities, it's got to be adequate for the cyclist's needs. It, it does, and um, 
I have to say that even at smaller stations, I often see at least one of the cycle racks in use. I think the, the bigger problem was uh, not thinking through. I mean, this and this is something that, that we found with a number of cycle facilities. So an example here would be Oban, which does have cycle parking. But um, Oban station, the, the car park goes down the length of the platform. And the cycle parking was put at the far end of the car park. And the entrance, you see, you have to walk the length of the platform, go in the entrance, and then, then walk back down. And it's uncovered. And there's a, a right by the entrance, there's the big um, pay and display machine with a big canopy over it and a trolley rack. And of course, what the, there was a bicycle chained to the trolley rack because they didn't you know, want to walk down. So it's, it's details like that. And I, I think the other thing, uh, which is not cycle parking, but is related to issues around uh, lifts and and access and trying to optimize access is uh, something that's simple that can be done for cyclists is wheel wells on stairs because a lot of cyclists would if they can prefer not to have to wait for the lift and contend with people who have luggage and all that sort of thing um, and that that's fairly simple to do and people can wheel their bikes up easily at Waverley, this has been done on the Carlton Road entrance, but then the wheel well is, is right next to the, the wall, and so if you try and wheel a bike up, the uh, pedals hit, hit the railings, and you can't actually get the bike up. So it's, it's these sort of things where you know, cycle parking's put in or wheel wells are put in, but the, the specification isn't done by someone who's actually thinking how it's going to be used, and so then it just doesn't get used, and that is a waste of money. That, and that's more of a concern for us, I think, than people not using it. Right, what you're saying is that it seems to be that some of the active, tra active travel cycle facilities are designed with people who have never been on a bike in their lives, which yeah. um, it's not too clever. So your idea about having an architect and active Yeah, and, I, and that's why we think yeah. having an architect... And it's also, um, going back to something Anne said about um, uh, sort of designing for, for people with disabilities, designing for convenient access for people with cycles and for, for pedestrians should really go right at the... So when we have... Queen Street development, there should be someone on the design team from the beginning responsible for thinking about these active travel issues, the cycling and the, the walking access, so that they can be designed in and it makes a huge difference to the effectiveness and the, the cost. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. David, um, just following on um, from that um, line of questioning, can I ask you, in terms of the recommendations that Transform Scotland have made um, arising from their recent research, that is to say, the active travel friendly standard, the active travel hubs, and the appointment of an active travel architect. What level of engagement have you had with Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government in order to take those recommendations forward? Well, we've, I mean, we've obviously, we, we actually sent them a, a draft copy of the report and, and the final report. And uh, as I say, we've, we've received uh, you know, a, po a positive response on a general level but nothing specific in terms of actually uh taking it taking the recommendations forward i'd say what next steps then if this is not just to be another report that gathers dust um well so uh, okay taking them separately the active travel hubs i think that's that's um an area where there is already clear movement um and in fact the the, the active travel conference next week. I'm, I'm running a workshop on active travel hubs where we're, we will hopefully get some, some of these stakeholders engaged so we can, we can look at, at what the best next steps are. Um, as I say, Transport Scotland has some level of funding. Abellio uh, or the ScotRail Alliance has a commitment to deliver cycle hubs. So I think that's one where we'd hope that there's already movement there, and so what needs to happen is Transport Scotland actually not necessarily micromanaging the implementation details of every active travel hub, but provide the broad overview to make sure that there is some sort of uh, connection between the different operators of travel hubs and that the process for developing the active travel hubs is appropriate in terms of making sure they fit with the local needs and are appropriate for their location and that we get a decent spread of them so that we have have them in reasonable locations so uh what that are you doing to ensure that we secure access to the european funding that you mentioned earlier that 
That is something Transport Scotland has been doing. I, I'm not involved with that specifically. I'm just aware that Transport Scotland was uh, working on that, and to my understanding is they have secured it. But I, I, I'd have to. I can certainly get back to you with the details of that if that's of use. Thank you. Um, the new ScotRail operator, Abelio, just staying with you, Mr. Warren, if I may, um, has committed to significant investment in new cycling facilities, and we've, you've alluded to that already. This morning, how significant do you think that will be in improving um, accessibility at our major railway stations for cyclists? And are there any um, additional um, measures that you would want them to address uh, in addition to what's already been highlighted by the company? I, it's not so much additional issues. I think it, it will a lot will depend on the details. So I think the broad the broad strokes of what they're planning are are, are excellent. It's then, it goes back to these, what I was talking about in terms of, you know, where you place the cycle parking, whether it's covered, um, if you put cycle lockers in, do people even know how to use them, where they can get a key from, if they can reserve them. So I think it will, it will be the details that are important. And um, so far, as I, I said before, Abelio has been very engaged and uh, not just with us, but in general. And I think if they continue along that, that path and they listen to feedback, I think there's a good chance that the improvements they have planned will make a, a significant difference and, and raise those standards. Okay. That's helpful. If I could um, return to the issue of Waverley, um, just for completeness. The, I'd like to ask you the question that I asked um, Ms McLean, and that is what level of consultation was there with your organisation prior to Network Rail imposing the ban on uh, vehicles entering the uh, the station, given that that has now had a knock-on effect for cyclists and pedestrians, as you outlined earlier? Uh, there's none at all. Um, and in, in fact, uh, we had been... Uh, we'd, well, we were auditing Waverley at the time as part of the interchange project, and we, we uh, had very good communication with the station manager, and as I say, they, uh, she and her team had created the route on the north ramp, um, and, and she was doing a lot of very proactive, good work, and um, it must have come as a surprise to her, because it mm -hmm. clearly wasn't in the plan, and so it okay. was a surprise to us as well. And do you see that as being an illustration of the attitude of network rail, which you referred to in the context of Queen Street, around not considering transport integration to be part of their remit. Is that another example of that approach? I would, yeah. I mean, I are, uh, uh, to this point, uh, I'd like to stress, because obviously things I, I hope will change with the new alliance structure. But to this point, Network Rail Scotland has not been uh, very receptive to our input and to the idea of considering the wider uh, integrated transport um, implications. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mike, you've got some questions. Yes, uh, thank you. The convener, um, I've got a great deal of uh, sympathy for pretty much everything I've heard here this morning. Um, living as I do on a tiny island on the west coast with no roads and no cars, I don't also tend to use public transport very often, and when I do occasionally go into having too much sympathy for Mr Mackenzie. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not seeking sympathy but I, but 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 I kind of understand uh, how you feel in as much as on the, the, the few occasions that I go into stations I find them confusing and actually quite frightening places. And I thought that um, Anne McLean made a very powerful point when she said that um, when when these access arrangements are good for people who suffer from disabilities they're also good pretty much for everybody. And just bearing that in mind, I wondered um, if you've done any, any research more generally amongst rail passengers to see if um, accessibility is important to people, to passengers more generally. We can, I think, all grasp the importance for people suffering from disabilities, but how much... Um, you, you know, importance to people more generally place on, on, on accessibility. 
we've done a we published a report last year, passenger priorities on Britain's railway, and it broke it down into countries what passengers wanted to see in Scotland, England, the north of England, the south west, the south east, and the priorities were very much the same. Uh, most of the priorities came out on train factors, actually uh, reliability, punctuality. When it came to stations, uh, it was about the availability of station staff. Passengers like to see a, a staff presence at stations. Uh, it was about uh, being safe and secure at stations, accessibility as well. But there's, there's a list there on our website. I couldn't give you the priorities off the top of my head, but there, it does actually prioritise what passengers want to see at stations. And one of the one of the top ones was uh, nothing to do with this, but was actually Wi-Fi at stations. Uh, but there is a there is a priority mat mat matrix there that we have that I can share with the committee. Very much, um, um, and, and I just wonder then, even if uh, if there are any particular groups within that study that you did, who maybe do other than people with disabilities who place. I mean, Anne, I think mentioned, you know, mothers with prams, you know, people with luggage. Um, are there any other groups beyond people suffering from disabilities who place a you know a higher emphasis on on accessibility? Basically, the, the groups you've, you've picked out, uh, you, you could be a commuter going to work on a Monday just with your, your briefcase, but on the weekend you're travelling with your children, <coughs> uh, you've got buggy, you've got luggage, etc. So your, your needs change on whatever purpose your, your journey is. And you know, Accessibility doesn't just benefit uh, the mobility access. It benefits all passengers, uh, all groups, basically elderly, uh, young mothers, young fathers. I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you, but are people aware of that? Are there any particular groups who are aware of that and who, when they respond to consultations and so on, say, yep, mothers, young, you know, young families, we place a higher importance on this than the, the general um, group of, 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 of passengers? The way that we conduct our surveys and, and break it down is, is basically an age profile and uh, the purpose of your journey, whether you're travelling on business, commute or leisure, it isn't in those ways that you're actually looking at it. Yeah, but yeah. maybe there's ways that we could look at it in those terms, but that information we don't have to hand, I'm yeah. afraid. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this was brought home to me. Some of us were on a committee trip in, in connection with another inquiry to Gothenburg in Sweden, and we were um, we went to the railway station to, you know, as part of our, our journey. And I was thinking that we sh it should have been called Tranquility Central or something like that. It was quite unlike any of the, the railway stations that you get in this country that seem to me to be chaotic, noisy, confusing and so on. And I think if you were to conduct a, a, a survey of passengers in Sweden, um, you might get quite a different emphasis on you know, what they place an importance on. And, and, and my point really, I'm, I'm leading up to my final question, which is, are you... Um, aware of any examples of good practice from other countries, from other parts of this country, or and 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 a, and a slight adjunct to that, other, you know, we're, we're increasingly embracing technology as a solution to some of the problems that we face. Are there any technological, maybe IT solutions for the kind of problems that we've been talking about this morning? We have done uh, work with passengers, and one of the barriers to using not just the, the rail network but buses as well is uncertainty. You know, for people who use public transport day in, day out, it's easy going into a, a station, going up to the ticket counter, buying a ticket. You take it for granted, but a lot of people, it's it's the unknown. They don't know for exact, you know, it's exact fare only. And you pay on the bus. You know, that's just the uncertainty of it. You don't know how to purchase a railway ticket or a, a bus ticket. It's actually goes back to that to that how that's simple because I've never used public transport for many, many years. 
and they wouldn't know how to go about it. That's one of the, the barriers that have to be overcome. Maybe technology does have a, a part to play in that going forward, but the barrier is actually uh, not not being all fair with the system, where it be any type of public transport. Thank you. Maybe if I just pick up on that quickly, you know, one of the solutions to that is uh, a sort of a properly integrated smart card. And if if you any of you ever visit London, when I visit London, I've this Oyster card. Um, which obviously don't need a season ticket or whatever, but it just stores an amount of cash on it. And then, I do, you know, it is a lot less stressful using public transport. Even it's easier for me to do that than it is to go to Glasgow and try and use the buses because as a resident of Edinburgh, I, I know the, how the buses work here. I, I just, you know, I, I'll walk in Glasgow instead of taking the bus because I'm just not quite exactly sure which bus, you know, whether it's exact fare or whatever, but, you know, you go to London and you don't worry about that because, you know, you've got the card and you're just going to touch it to go in. And so I think um, also going back to questions about how Transport Scotland can bring some sort of order to, to some of this, uh, the ticketing situation specifically is one where if we had a consistent, uh, you know, that's where you, technology could be used and, the readers are installed in buses across Scotland because of Transport Scotland's investments. We actually have the infrastructure largely in place, but it's the logistics of, of getting you know multiple companies to accept the same thing and, and obviously work that out. But that's an area where we could see a lot of improvement, I think. Thank you. Anybody else? Examples of good practice from elsewhere or examples of the use of technology give some examples of good practice that help disabled people are actually happening here in scotland mm -hmm. because it started with cess trans and then tac trans and now high trans and i'm hoping it's going to to spread all across scotland um and it's a card that you can use on the bus or the train it says what your disability is it says what kind of help you need and it's excellent and it's supported by the, the confederation of passenger transport have also you know, got, got a similar sort of card. And the more um, regional transport partnerships introduce them, the more I think people will be more at ease using public transport because you just have to show this card. You don't have to go into lengthy explanations. And it says things like, I have a mobility problem, please wait till I sit down. Or I cannot see, please show me which way to put my card into the, you know, the machine. Um, and it's quite simple and I'm told by Cess Trans, Tac Trans and High Trans that in actual fact it doesn't cost a great deal. So it's cost effective because it makes people more willing to use public transport. <laughs> Not just trains, obviously, but all public transport. Um, and that's, that's good practice in Scotland, which I think we ought to be quite proud of. What, what, what I was getting at, and, and you've, you've reminded me that um, you mentioned, for instance, Queen Street, the taxi rank situation at Queen Street was an example of good design, good practice. Um, you know, like once it's all been redone, you know. <laughs> sure. It just, yeah. It's good yeah. at the moment. <laughs> are, are there any stations, given that we're talking about accessibility and we're talking about stations, are there any stations you've ever come across that are a joy to use from the point of view, the perspective of the difficulties that people with disabilities uh, you know, uh, experience. May I, may I highlight Sterling, if I may convene? Um, I use Sterling quite regularly. Um, it's, it's what I like to call a clean station, as opposed, as opposed to one that's filled with obstacles. It's, it's straightforward, it's bright, it's airy. One, one walks into the front, straight up to the gate line. There's scarf waiting just there to assist you. Um, there are less than half the platforms that Sterling are, are used for frequent services. The scares, as was highlighted in the submission, although there are quite a lot of them, the, the depth shallow. of each step is, is very shallow. So for somebody who has trouble climbing scares, that can often make it a lot easier. It also means you can get up the scares faster if one needs to, um, if, if one so wishes. Um, and it's just a station which you know, I, could, I could actually consider using that station independently if I had to. Um, there, are, there are no real areas of concern where one could presumably get lost. 
uh, there's level uh, lift access across the tracks that's available. And it, it's just the skation with ticks in awful lot of boxes. I mean, yes, there are issues outside the skation, but if we look at the skation infrastructure itself, uh, and you, you mentioned the term majority to use, and I have to say Sterling um, is. I, sorry, there's sorry. some smaller stations in Scotland that are actually a pleasure to use. Um, and actually, I have to say, some of them are unstaffed, but I'd just like to say something about unstaffed stations, because we I've been talking about passenger assist, and our sadness is that not... So not as many people know about it as we would like to happen. But one of the things that passenger assist will do is if your nearest station is not accessible or unstaffed and you would feel um, safe, they will actually pay for a taxi for you to your nearest accessible station. Now, I think that's another example of very good practice. Thank you very much. That's been very useful. Thank you. Um, can I invite members to ask any final questions they may have? Mary? Thank please. you, convener. Can I ask a very um, brief question? And it, it relates back to the, <coughs> the, the issue of, of signage. And I'm thinking specifically of signage in a station that's undergoing a major refurbishment. And if you think about a station that's not been mentioned this morning, which is undergoing major refurbishment, Dundee. Dundee. Um, the waterfront in Dundee has, has been undergoing major refurbishment for a number of years, and I know there are difficulties accessing the station. Um, for someone that has absolutely no disabilities, it's a very confusing station to get in and out of because of the, the, the degree of, of work that's getting done. Um, and it obviously links into the work that will be getting done at Glasgow Queen Street as part of the, the Egypt upgrade. Upgrade. So, do Network Rail or Transport Scotland consult with Max about what could be done to make it easier for passengers? I, when Waverley was all the upheaval mm. in Waverley, which we hoped would produce lovely things, which it did, by the way, while the taxis were still allowed in. Um, I can't resist getting that dig in every time. Um, they, no, um, the I have to say, uh, Network Rail. And the station manager and staff consulted Max about signage while the work was going on. And indeed, you will see still in places the yellow lines on the, on the ground that we asked on the basis that certainly visually impaired people look down. But also yellow is, a, is an advance in colour, so it's, you know, it's a good... And the, the putting signs on the on the hoarding at the right level for different people. They were, I have to say, they were very good about that. I, it's, I, I actually can compliment them on that at that time. It's going back a few years now because, you know, Waverley's been finished. But yes, they did. And we certainly are being consulted about Sorry, I'm looking to Hussein about Queen Street, aren't we? We are indeed. We've got yes. colleagues who've been working on that yes. from, pretty much from, from close to the outset. Yes. Um, and are working to do exactly what we referred to earlier, convener, and that is yeah. attempting to solve problems from the outset yeah. um, rather than coming back... Highlighted as an area of good practice. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you, I, well, Sorry. Can I just jump in quickly and say, um, conversely, that I think uh, network... If we look at Haymarket Network Rail's consideration of cycle needs was not, not good, and, and we've got a strong uh, local cycle group in Edinburgh that could have provided a lot of useful input that, again, easy to do uh, early stages and would have made a big difference, but they were they're not receptive to that. And so, again, it's a lot of public money being spent. The government has uh, has target, you know, the cycling action plan for Scotland, the 10% target and all that. When we're spending millions of pounds of public money, I just don't, don't see how that's compatible with not um, getting as integrated a solution as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Are there any further questions from members? Um, can I ask each of the witnesses if they would um, just reflect for a moment on what the one single outcome they would want from this piece of work that the committee is undertaking to be and to share that with the committee? Perhaps, Mr Sampson, you might want to kick us off. Regarding accessibility, I think it's a... 
as a, like I said at the beginning, it's a more joined up approach, not looking at rail in a, a rail silo or bus in a bus silo or taxi in a taxi silo. It's a more joined up approach, a more partnership approach that can look at con connectivity, integration and encourage modal shift as well at the same time. Okay, Mr Warren. Yeah, along, along similar lines, that when, um, and this sort of goes back to our active travel architect recommendation, that when we're spending big amounts of, of public money or small amounts of public money and we're doing major redevelopments or reconfiguring stations or, or whatever it may be, that um, you know, the needs of pedestrians and cyclists are fully considered and integrated into the plans and the the overall integration with the transport infrastructure, the public transport in infrastructure, is considered and not, uh, you know, out with the remit of the project. And consult with spokes when it comes to in Edinburgh. Edinburgh yes. <laughs> Go bike in Glasgow. You know. Yes. Right. But yeah, I mean, more more generally, consult with local groups. There's and it's not just cycling. Um, you know, it's clear from Max. There's a lot of really um, high quality knowledge, really well considered. Um, experts in local communities and um, you know writing them off because they're not doing it five days a week for a high salary is just not acceptable these are people who really know what they're talking about and can make a big difference to the outcome okay thank you Ms. McLean I, I think I would I would echo this this um, interconnectivity and point out that it's not just in major stations it's in stations all across Scotland I use Aviemore a relatively small station regularly. So it's my local station. Um, there's a taxi rank and there's buses. But if you didn't know the station, you wouldn't know where to go to get either. And it's, it's making sure that these things all link up. It's not that they're difficult to find if you know where to look for them. But it's as you walk out of this strange station in, in the beautiful highlands in the Cairngorm National Park, very good. But Where's the bus stop and where's the taxi rank? You know, and it's 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 so that sort of thing is actually very simple and doesn't need a lot of money spent. Yes, in bigger stations, you know, the, the sorry, when you're looking in cities and what have you, it probably is. But right across Scotland, look at the the stations and see where they connect. If they do, in fact, of course, to buses, um, the the it it's. It's just the same argument, except on a smaller scale. Thank you. It's very um, important. And Mr. Pat, will you have the final word? Thank you very much. I think um, you know, I, I won't repeat what colleagues have already said. I, I completely endorse that. I think my um, my biggest wish would be to see some of the information regarding how life can be made easier um, to be marketed more to the travelling public. Um, my Colleague Yang has mentioned passenger assist. I won't dwell on that. That is a, it's a service level, um, a service level feature. I, I realise the committee remit has covered infrastructure, but you know, for example, you have cases where to get from one side of the station to the other side of a station on a small highland station requires walking a considerable distance and over a bridge. Now, if one doesn't know that there is a quicker way to access that. Um, it's obviously putting putting travelling public at a considerable disadvantage and inconvenience. Um, very often, information for disabled passengers seems to be isolated into either websites or within the station, or if you know who to speak to, then you'll get that information. Uh, with respect, Convener, I don't see why that should be the case. If, if we can market information for tourists, for cyclists, for anybody else, in you know widely in the public domain where anyone can see it, anyone can access that. I I honestly fail to see why the same cannot be cannot be said for information relating to disabled travellers. And it goes back to what colleagues were saying. If it works for one, it works for all. Um, and I think that, that's a major gap in the infrastructure that we have. Okay, thank you very much. And can I thank all the witnesses for their evidence this morning. Um, that concludes uh, today's business. And I now close this meeting of the committee. Can I ask members just to...